Well, the first supercontinuum um, was observed by Alfano and uh, Shapiro. And it was just pumping light in, into this sample cell. And you had these filaments, you had the self-focusing, you had filamentation. Uh, so it was a very spatial temporal thing, and it was essentially very, very uncontrolled. <clears throat> and I showed that the other night, and this was the setup. Just the processes that are contributing are self-phase modulation, parametric generation, Raman, and ba basically the break up into these filamentations. And totally uncontrolled. Uh, in fiber, then you can get the first stuff done by, by um, uh, stolen. And then the first classic uh, sort of supercontinuum source uh, based on, on pumping with uh, neodymium in the eye. And this shows, uh, as I'll repeat, uh, essentially all the classic features of the pump pulse then followed by the Raman orders. And this here is the, a, a very, it's a, quite a poor fiber. This is very early fiber from about 1978. So the loss is exceedingly high and the water loss is enormous. So it just eats in almost down to the zero level. And then, but there's still enough power to be able to pump into the higher order stokes. And from that then this so-called soliton Raman continuum evolves. <clears throat> these, these fibers actually have a zero dispersion that's sort of set up around 1.3. And so your efficiency to see four-wave mixing is very, very low. Uh, and your efficiency, you, clearly you won't evolve any solitons in this region. So the four-wave mixing is sort of negligible. This is it amplified by a factor of 10. Uh, and so you always see just everything evolving to the long wavelength side in such a supercontinuum. What really changed was uh, in 2000 when the sort of new wave of supercontinua came along. Uh, and this was driven by photonic crystal fibers. And the first paper, of course, by Ranka, uh, looking at uh, a Thai sapphire, which is around 800, pumping a supercontinuum source um, with a zero dispersion around about 775. So this is just sitting in the anomalous dispersion regime. It has an pulses of the order of 30 to 100 femtoseconds, uh, wavelength about 790, so it's lying clearly in the anomalous regime, the longer side here. The peak power is quite high, 8 kilowatts. Average power is quite modest. And so this power is essentially s spread out across all this supercontinuum. But the important thing, of course, to note from this is that the supercontinuum evolves to the short wavelength side. And this is clearly not due to four wave mixing. Uh, <clears throat> but this really, really set out the sort of standard for what supercontinuum should be. And it was all driven essentially by uh, the photonic crystal fiber. So, in that, the big Real advantage is the fact that you can control the group velocity dispersion and you can control where the zero dispersion is. So it meant that supercontinuum sources can actually be driven by lasers that were readily available. Rather than relying on trying to develop special systems all lying up around 1.5, 1.6 or 1.3, it was driven by the Thai Sapphire laser, which was already mode lock sitting there. Of course, the other thing that you're able to do uh, with the photonic crystal fibers and stuff like that is you can control the nonlinearity, changing the mode size or whatever. So this introduction of this sort of series of new fibers where you can have small cores, you can change the doping, you can uh, uh, essentially in standard fibers, or you can have photonic crystal fibers where you can change the offset of the holes so that you can shift the dispersion you can change the confinement in that. Or you can use tapered fibers, uh, which is actually will enhance nonlinearity once again, simply by enhancing the power density. Or you can have non-silica fibers, where you can actually have high nonlinearity, uh, but usually these tend to operate in different wavelength ranges. So you're now controlling everything. You're in control of the dispersion, the nonlinearity, and the confinement. And this really leads to new applications in supercontinuum. So if you look 
uh, around the zero dispersion, of course, you're going to get four-wave mixing. If you're back in the normal dispersion regime, well, of course, cross-phase modulation and ramming and uh, broadening, uh, self-phase modulation, temporal broadening is the main processes. Up in the anomalous regime, ramming uh, and ramming solitons and ramming compression or soliton compression are the main techniques. And where you are, where you want to pump depends on how you're going to control all these different processes. <clears throat> of course, you can change the fiber structure from single mode fiber through these highly nonlinear fibers doped with a lot of germanium, which enhances the nonlinearity. Use PCFs, or you can use essentially micro tapers, um, very, very small confinement, uh, essentially nano, nano type scale. Uh, of course, changing the dispersion in the fiber is not new. Um, this was always controlled in the past through dispersion shifted fibers or hi highly nonlinear fibers simply by changing the, the, the waveguide dispersion or changing the doping. So you can depress the cladding or you can enhance the uh, nonlinearity. You can make it smaller core by including germanium. Uh, and all this are, are techniques really to just m modulate your, your parameter. Um, the PCF itself, of course, is controlled very strongly by um, the hole size and the pitch. And if you change the, uh, the, the, the air fill ratio of that, then, of course, that shifts uh, the, the, really the, the role of the air and the, uh, the overlap of the, essentially the, the normalized dispersion is controlled by the air. And as you change that air fill fraction, you can shift your dispersion from about a micron down to the region of about 500 nanometers. And I, I think that's about probably the lowest that's been demonstrated. If you take a standard single air fill fraction in your PCF and simply just taper it or pull it down narrow and narrow each time, as that begins to narrow, then as you change the, your separation essentially with the same air fill fraction, but the separation between the holes is changing, essentially all you're doing is making the whole thing narrower. You can see that as it becomes narrower, you shift towards the short wavelength side. And this is actually quite important when you begin to look and think of tapers or using other sources. And tapers can be used in essentially in standard fiber, and exactly the same happens if you taper it down uh, to sort of, <clears throat> and this can, you can generate tapers of tens, a few centimeters, taper it down to about two microns in, in diameter, then you can shift from your standard single mode fiber all the way for one micron. In fact, you have a double zero system with a zero about 500 and a second zero with that about 1.3. And the same can happen in PCF. Uh, and this was done, actually, this was done for us by the people at Bath, where Philip originally was. And one of the problems, of course, as you begin to taper these, is actually maintaining the pressure in the holes to make sure that you do get no collapse. The other thing, apart from the, the sort of hardware, has been the software. And the modeling uh, and the improvements that's taken place uh, in modeling supercontinuum or modeling nonlinearity is just phenomenal. Um, and you now take your generalized Schrodinger equation that was very, very simple, that was produced by Hasegawa to describe your solitons, and now you just add in everything. And this is just adding terms constantly to improve the model. Looking at dispersion, self-steepening of the pulses, and here you have terms including your surface modulation, four-way mixing, your Raman term. Remember, it's really, really complicated, this. If you think of it, the mode confinement alone is massively different as you head from the visible up to the infrared in this. And, you know, the mode size changes enormously. So your nonlinearity is changing. So all this has to be modeled and included stepwise in the system. And this is a modeled uh, supercontinuum from John Dudley, uh, whom I've collaborated with. And it looks, looks quite good. And John has shown that, in fact, if you have a <coughs> femtosecond-type pulses, 50 femtoseconds, this is looking essentially very similar to the Ranka result in 50, 15 centimeters of PCF. Now, one thing for sure is, using femtosecond pulses and PCF, you aren't going to make a fortune selling PCF. 
that's for sure. Uh, and some companies have fallen by the wayside simply selling PCF um, for this application. You can see that, in fact, this is the launch of the Pulse, but only after about a centimeter, quite an impressive super continuum has evolved. And here you see the evolution after about 15 centimeters. And I think back to just earlier in the talk, this bit here, that's that soliton self-frequency shift. That's that soliton that's shooting away. And that's him there. That's the soliton there. He's sort of left everything else behind. And he's shot off into the long wavelength side. And he's delayed. So the modeling is quite, quite good. And it's all based essentially on high order soliton instability, where you simply launch your soliton. And this is looking at the soliton over a soliton length. And what you see is it begins to fragment. It n narrows down. So you have your broad spectrum. After you get your broad spectrum, this is a very high order soliton. It's not going to do that breathing. It just falls apart. All these sol This is the soliton flying off it. High order soliton dynamics is dominating your super continuum. But as Feynman says, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, it doesn't matter how smart you are, if it doesn't agree with the experiment, you're wrong. <laughs> and that's it. Tough luck. The most annoying thing about Dudley's work is that it's really, really good. <laughs> It really agrees remarkably well with the experiment. So you can see there's a, a really good one-to-one -one correspondence between this. And it's simply down to understanding this process of what's going on. And you can see there's lots and lots of stuff. This is this Raman shift. This is the pulse compressing. The high-order solitons enter, compresses down to this very short pulse, suddenly fragments, boom. The solitons fly off it. It's leaving dispersive waves behind. Here's the dispersive waves here. There's bits of interference, other solitons bleeding off it. Here, bits here are being tracked in the normal dispersion. I wonder what they are. We'll see that later, what they are. So it's kind of complicated. And the big advantage is when you, when you look at this theoretically, you can actually do like a one-to-one -one correspondence of what's happening. If you look at this sort of intense pulse here, well, of course, this is a soliton, and it's associated with this long wavelength side. So this is your Raman soliton, your soliton self-frequency shift that's moving away. You look at the bit that's sort of over here, sort of a bit small, and it's associated with the remainder of your pump pulse. That's the sort of remainder of what's left of your pulse. The next bit is this sort of low-level bit, sort of up, delayed a bit, so it must be shifted quite a bit in, in frequency. And that's actually this dispersive wave lying in the normal dispersion regime. And you get other bits that have show sort of oscillations, and they can be explained as well. So experimentally, how do you, do you probe that? Well, you, you go back to this guy here, Ed, Ed Tracy, who, who actually was the guy who introduced the grating power compression. And he came up with the idea of if you take a short pulse and you strobe it through um, your chirp pulse or your super continuum or whatever you have, and essentially you do a cross correlation, you simply mix these together, you can generate different frequencies if this is essentially a single frequency. You mix these, you'll see a different frequency so you can propagate in time and plot out the, the frequency. So you shift this and see plot out what frequency you measure as the difference between these, or the sum. And this is really just XFROG. So you can do this with a Thai Sapphire, delay the Thai Sapphire, generate your PCF, and then mix these, do the sum frequency generation in a crystal, and look at it in a spectrograph. And if you do that, theoretically, this is now proposing what's happening. Here you have the soliton. Now this is the long wavelength soliton. It's flying off to the long wavelength side. This is the soliton self-frequency shift. This is another soliton that's evolving from the breakup of this multi-soliton. It just fires them all off. And they're different wavelengths, so they have different delays and different times. This is another soliton. 
Here, this is your dispersive wave. So this is your dispersive wave associated with this short wavelength side. This is your soliton here that's sitting very far out. It's this side. These are your solitons here. And here's your two sort of bits of radiation at the same time that are beaten together to give this 115 terahertz beat or whatever that you see. Experimentally, when you measure it, you get that, which is pretty good. The agreement's pretty good. So it's all down to this, <coughs> but all hell breaks out after this compression. So after this, this is actually just noise. <laughs> Total noise. And if Scott was to use this for his comb generation, all the satellites would collapse. You know? <laughs> just be the end of it all. Now the other thing, of course, is that the whole thing is unstable. And the whole thing is also noise driven as well. Noise plays in a very, very important part. And if you look at the supercontinuum, this is essentially the supercontinuum from a femtosecond system. And this would be the supercontinuum that you saw in Rankis paper. And it looked lovely, and people said, wow, look at that. Perfectly flat top. It's just perfect. This is just unbelievable. If you look at it from shot to shot, this is what it looks like. Okay? And you can see that this edge is all over the place. Here, sometimes you have a soliton cell frequency shift going out to here. Other times, little. And all you're doing is integrating these. And that's essentially what's happening. And this brings us in the other sort of thing, rogue waves. Um, which is something I sort of have a bee in my bonnet about. Um, it's said that the solitons lying the long wavelength side emulate rogue waves. Now, rogue waves have been known essentially in water for quite some time. And this actually shows you a recording of it. This is actually the result of a rogue wave, by the way. Rogue waves carry a lot of energy, and at sea, these can, this can be you know, fatal. These rogue waves can actually take ships out, big ships as well. And this is a rogue wave here that's sort of lying enormously above the normal level. And this was detected, satellite detected. And they, they, is that, they the there? The that was meters. That's meters. Yeah, yeah. That's a 20, 20 meter, 20 meter, 20 meter wave. And there's one in the set that's a satellite image over there? Yes, yeah, okay. yeah. And so these, these things here, they can form from everything, you know, the continental shelf can whoop, collapse a little bit in, in, in wherever sets up a perturbation, small root ripple, and this thing builds up and shoots across the ocean. And it's been proposed that, in fact, these are the kind of things that happen in supercontinuum. And you take your mode lock laser, you generate your supercontinuum, but the big problem is it's very, very difficult to measure this in real time. So what you have to do is you have to map your sort of you have to change your sort of wavelength or your time into wavelength. Uh, so what you do is, in fact, you forget about a lot of it. You filter off the long wavelength side so that you're simply looking at the rogue events, the long wavelength side that you think are these rogue things that are happening. You know, sometimes they happen, sometimes they don't. And you take that rogue event, which are femtosecond type pulses, you put it into a fiber let it disperse. So all it does is it disperses and gets longer. And because it's longer now, you can look at it in real time. And so this can be looked at in a fast scope. And this is the kind of thing that you would see as you vary the power. And this was done by Solly in, in 2007. And what they see is that if you, you look at the intensity bins here, you see that you have an L-shaped histogram of you recording the, the events. So in actual fact, the most common is sort of low-level type events. There's not a lot, uh, you know, basically everything, you always get a count down here somewhere. As you begin to look at the high-order bins, then, of course, there's, the events are few and far between. But these are sort of the solitons happening. And because of the L-shaped structure, this is said that this represents some sort of rogue event. This is some sort of thing that happens abnormally. <coughs> And this is what they look like in supercontinuum. Um, this is your sort of 
evolution of the spectrum, and you can see the, the, the wavelength here as you propagate down the fiber. And this is this row gauge here. And in this system here, and all you do is you just run your simulations quite a few times, and sometimes you see it, some, now you see it, now you don't, essentially. And it seems to, you know, it, you, you have to feed noise into the system. But really, it's just noise. That's all it is. It's, it's the statistics of noise in a new wrapping. And it's just the fact that if you have your noisy soliton, of course he's going to shift like hell. You know, uh, uh, and it's the soliton cell frequency shift. That's essentially all it is. Quite a few years earlier, in 1988, Govea Neto and, uh, in our lab um, demonstrated, in fact, if you had essentially modulational instability, generating essentially a sideband, that if you seeded it, i.e. put a little bit of noise in, a little bit more of modulation on top, then this thing would shoot off like hell and you'd generate solitons. And in fact, you can control the whole thing anyway. If you seed the whole system, then it controls the noise dynamics. And in fact, you can essentially kill off your rogue waves essentially by seeding them. And that gives stability to it. Uh, and this, uh, this system here was very simple. You generated sort of 100 picosecond pulses, generated the modulational instability in this, uh, and <clears throat> this actually then acts as the, the seed. Uh, you could, for a second fiber. Here, you could take part of your pump pulse and now put your pump pulse into an identical fiber. So essentially, you, you'd say, okay, if we use 600 milliwatts of pump in this fiber, we get this modulation instability. Now what you do is you take part of this, you take about 15 milliwatts of seed, and now only 45 milliwatts, so the net is still a pump of 60 milliwatts, but there's 15 milliwatts of seed, i.e. noise, modulation instability noise, and you seed into that, and you can see the change is enormous. Spectrally, you're generating this long wavelength edge. These are the solitons whooshing off this and controlling the noise. And this has been done. And in fact, it was done also uh, later and put in using CW signals. And this is a CW signal uh, done by us uh, in 1990 and generating 250 femtosecond pulses uh, to the long wavelength side. So that... Uh, has brought me to the end of the... Uh, I meant to give you questions. Uh, the thing is, though, if, I, if I have to ask you a question, I, I don't know, I have to mark it, do you? <laughs> so uh, really, in a way, all I want you to do is just think about what's been done or told this morning. The questions I've been asking are very simple. Uh, what I'd like you to do is just do a quick back-of-the-envelope calculation to work out, say, for example, if you have a 10 milliwatt laser pointer, you know, something like this, and it has a 5 milli millimeter spot size on the board, well, what's the electric field associated with that? And then take a, a microjoule pulse, peak a second pulse, and focus that down to 10 microns. What's the electric field that you will get from that? So just compare those. And then I have a... Uh, the, these are things you just have to think about. You don't have to work anything out. Just think about it. How could you actually, under what conditions could you take a pulse and spectrally filter it? So you make the bandwidth of the pulse shorter, yet the pulse will shorten in time. That doesn't seem right, does it? So how, how can you do that? I can assure you you can, so you think about it how you do it, okay? And then, oh, pardon me. The other, the other thing, I, uh, sorry. The other thing I want to ask you is, um, you, you saw Hokusai's wave breaking, didn't you? Um, so what I would like you to do is uh, you see, tell us what happens with wave breaking in the fiber regime, in the optical regime. How does optical wave breaking actually manifests itself. If you were to look at, say, at, at uh, 
a pulse traveling down a fiber? How would, how would you be able to tell that there was wave breaking going on? Okay. And then the other thing I'd like you to think about is, if you think back to the old days, okay, you use self phase modulation and grating pairs to compress the pulse, and that's temporal compression. How do you obtain spectral compression? Are you able to do that? So that's three little puzzles, okay? And talk to them yourselves and just work that out. Okay, thanks very much. And in, in, the next, in the next lectures, I'll, what I'll do is I'll show you how essentially the super continuum sources are rubbish, okay? I've spent my career 10 years working on them, and now I'm telling you they're absolute rubbish to work with. So, so um, there's better ways to sort of generate pulses. So we look at how, what the problems are, and then I'll show you some of the alternatives based on fiber. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Roy. Uh, I think we have time for one quick question, maybe. Once again, if anyone wants to ask questions after, I'm ha happy to answer anything that you want to ask. Yeah. Okay.